Last weekend, the terrorist group Hamas launched a barbaric attack on Israel. Thousands of terrorists descended upon the southern region of the country, and they committed unspeakable atrocities, unleashing terror upon innocent Israelis, killing and kidnapping women and children, murdering the elderly, burning homes with people still inside. To date, 1,300 Israelis have been killed, with estimates of up to 150 more being held hostage. The bloodiest day for the Jewish community since the Holocaust. And we have to talk about it. We cannot look away or walk away. The United States stands with the people of Israel. We stand against Hamas. We stand against terrorism in all its forms. But sadly, unlike in the wake of 9-11, we do not stand together. The usual suspects, yep, the chaos conference that is the Republican Party, is using this moment, this horrific moment and acute suffering of the people of Israel and the innocent Palestinian civilians caught in the crossfire to guess what? Yep, to attack President Biden. They tweet, I stand with Israel while simultaneously trying to disparage and discredit the man most able to help the people of Israel. He is the president of the United States. Immense suffering is an opportunity for them. And you don't have to take my word for it. Just ask Rana McDaniel, the RNC chairwoman. She said the quiet part out loud when she said that the Hamas attack on Israel was a great opportunity for Republicans. Since then, members of her party have used the slaughter of more than 1,300 Israelis to attack President Biden, to attack Democrats, to stoke xenophobia, inflame Islamophobia, to fearmonger while telling Americans to arm up with AR-15s, and their deck stain lacquered leader used the unspeakable atrocities committed to blame Benjamin Netanyahu, all because he had the audacity to refuse the invitation to disparage Joe Biden over speakerphone in front of the press. They say they stand with Israel, but they don't. They stand for themselves and for Donald Trump. This is who they are. They will use unimaginable suffering of millions of people to benefit themselves. It's inhumane, it's un-American, it's unforgivable, and they cannot and should not be entrusted with the reins of power ever again. I was extremely fortunate to be able to talk about this incredibly important topic with someone who knows this subject from the inside out. Someone for whom this is deeply, deeply personal. Joel Rubin is a national security expert who worked as a senior State Department official in the Obama administration. He's a progressive activist, a local government elected official, and a Jewish community leader. And he is running for Congress in Maryland's sixth district. This was an incredibly important conversation, one which taught me a lot and moved me to tears. It was a hard conversation to have, but an absolutely necessary one. My guest today is Joel Rubin, former Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Legislative Affairs in the Obama administration and current candidate for Congress. Welcome, Joel, and thank you so much for joining me today. Joe, it's an honor. Thank you. (laughs) The honor is mine. Um, And um, unfortunately, we have not the best circumstances to have this conversation. I wish that we had met virtually over, you know, better circumstances, but these are um, the times we live in. So I wanted to talk largely about what has been unfolding in Israel. I know this is very personal for you, but also you have so much perspective based on, you know, your, your, your public service and um, in this regard. So my first question 
is how did this happen? I know that's going to be a pretty broad answer. I just, I think a lot of people, we were talking before we started recording, a lot of people are are kind of getting this story now somewhere what seems like, you know, many, many chapters into a book that is, um, you know, much more complex than they realize. So they're asking these questions too, you know, how are we looking at 1200 or more Israelis dying from this attack, um, from this horrible Hamas attack and all the wounded and of course the hostages, how, how essentially did this happen? Well, Joe, uh, first and foremost, I really am grateful to you for providing a platform to have this kind of a conversation because this is an issue that is so complex and so multi-layered that it requires a lot of conversation, a lot of reading, a lot of watching, and a ton of listening. So um, thank you for, for doing this and, 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 um, to your audience, thank you for, for tuning into this, this kind of a, a discussion. Uh, look, there are multiple layers to think about, about how this happened. There's the, the moment itself of the actual heinous, barbarous attack where Hamas terrorists traversed a fence, knocked it down, launched an invasion of Southern Israel and massacred what's now about 1300 innocent civilians in their sleep, women, children, um, young liberal 20 somethings at a rave, a peace rave, a dance party in the Southern desert under the, the moon. Um, that's the, the immediate, how did this happen? Then there's another layer, uh, which is the layer of the Israeli Palestinian conflict and the direct conflict between these two peoples, two sides, an unending, uh, type of, of, of direct uh, conflict over land and territory. And then there's, you can add another layer to that, this layer of broader Arab-Israeli uh, discord and, and, and conflict over century. Uh, one could go back even further, religious conflict. I tend to be the kind of person that really does focus on, to your question about right now in this specific moment. I think that's, I want us to be as practical as we can on this, because a lot of times people get into this conversation about Israel, Palestine, and they, they throw in ideological positions that only make it harder and make it more difficult and destructive. You know, to the person who was just murdered, they're not asking about why am I being murdered because of something that happened 100 years ago. They're looking at that assailant right now. So that attack occurred because it was a premeditated attack by Hamas. They've been planning, it, it, it appears now, over a year of planning, operational planning to organize themselves. Now, Hamas is a terrorist organization that physically controls the Gaza Strip, which is one of two primary territories for the Palestinian people. The other being the West Bank, as it's known, which is uh, occupied by Israel, in addition to being governed by Palestinian leaders who are uh, known as the Palestinian Authority, and they have conflict with Hamas. So Hamas, they organized this attack. They've been continually bombarding Israel from the Gaza Strip for a number of years. They've assembled a massive arsenal of rockets that have been sent into southern Israel. And what they did was they had a very complex, multi-layered uh, invasion on land, air, and sea, uh, an assault into southern Israel at a moment where it appears that Israeli forces along the southern uh, part of Israel along the Gaza border were not uh, uh, a paying attention like they should have been, or b as present as they should have been. They were deployed to the West Bank and other parts where there's been unrest, and then c there's been political dysfunction and decision making in the Israeli leadership. So it, it's it's going to come out in investigations over time, but essentially there was a vulnerability there, and Hamas saw it and exploited it. And then what they did, and I'll, I'll close with this because I, you know, this could be like a three-hour seminar. I'm not going <laughs> to do to you uh, at all or to the listeners. But essentially, what happened is, um, is they they traversed the border. Several thousand of them, it appears now, several thousand of them literally went door to door in a massacre. It was there is nothing that one can describe it other than a pure massacre. If you think about like the Balkans, there was Srebrenica where men were rounded up and just massacred about 70,000. Um, there have been massacres in northern Iraq when I was in the State Department and the Obama administration by ISIS. 
where they went and, and, and just massacred a population of known as Yazidis and sort of a, 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 a just a pure massacre. And they hit some these these villages and kibbutzim, which are collective farms, very liberal. The state of Israel's history is founded by these kinds of of um, of uh, outposts and, and farms. Uh, and they went in and they just went door to door. And they killed families and they rounded up babies and massacred them and um, without remorse. And then they stole 150 people and brought them back into Gaza. And, and that's, that's why we are where we are right now in this crisis. Um, I don't think that there's anything political about these atrocities. You know, that's the thing. Like there's, if, if you're a human being and you hear what you just said and it doesn't touch you in some way, um, it doesn't matter what letter is next to your name when you vote. Um, this is not a partisan issue. Um, these are atrocities and they, they, um, they, they impact you, uh, personally in, because, um, you know, as a mom, as as a human being, um, it's unfathomable. Again, it's not, this is not a political question. Um, this is the moment again, where can, can I yeah. comment on, on what you just said? Yeah, of course. I, I yeah. Say, I mean, like, so I'm a dad, you're a mom. I have vulnerable children. They're teens. And like, I'm just unable to physically imagine, but I try to like, what if I saw my daughter in that? Like, I can't even bear to contemplate it. And like that moment of like the young woman put on a motorcycle and driven into hell. Yeah. And um, it, go, it, it it's the kind of repugnant behavior and, and pain that never goes away. As a Jew, I'll just say this as Jews, like we sort of live in our pain every day and have been for thousands of years and have been since the Holocaust. And Israel itself in many ways is like the refuge of last resort for the Jewish world and the place where we are supposed to be safe. And so not only is this painful from everything you just talked about in the physical destruction and human rights violation and, and gross war crimes, it also punctured a sense of security across the entire Jewish world globally, including in the United States, a sense that we are extraordinarily vulnerable and it could be any of us at any moment. That's what happened as well. And that is uh, terrorism, right? So, right, like that's the, the goal is to terrorize you. And one of Hamas's primary objectives is to essentially eradicate Jewish people from the earth. And so to terrorize you to the point where they were able to puncture that that sort of sense of at least relative safety um it is that is the objective of terrorism and i'm and i'm so sorry about that that is um along with all of the other layers to this um again to the atrocities here that is a layer i had not considered and i appreciate that you shared that perspective with me because it's very profound and it's something that i don't think a lot of people would have ever realized until you said it you know until they heard someone say it um you know, the only thing that anybody here could ever kind of, and you can't make any kind of equivalency to, but, you know, after 9-11, how it was this just different sense of feeling safe here and on our own soil, you know, that was just, it's not the same, but it is something that at least sort of echoes the same similar sentiments, you know, about safety and that sense of safety. That's I, I, I mean, I, I, I'll just, I'll just one more point on that, right? Like, you know, there's a discussion now in the Jewish world about the kids in college, for example, or, you know, I see it in my professional work as well. Like, this is a moment where we feel deeply vulnerable. And we're seeing statements from colleges expressing solidarity with Hamas. Yeah. And imagine if you're a Jewish kid. It's October, so you're in school. And you're looking around at your classmates thinking, do they wish I'm dead? Um, this, you know, synagogues are, we're petrified mm -hmm. community centers. 
like this is not some kind of like fantasy. Mm-hmm. Only about 75, 80 years ago, there was an attempt to destroy and eliminate all the Jews worldwide and 6 million of us were murdered. Genocide is not some, some uh, uh, unknown experience to the Jewish people. And so the kind of savagery that these Israelis experienced and these people experienced bespeaks a lack of recognition of us as humans. And then the concomitant silence from significant quarters and it only compounds the fear. And there's like not a lot of Jews in the world, less than 15 million of us globally. So like we're a tiny population. So you're seeing this sort of deep fear, which is is um, rooted in reality of our life experience and our community experience. And on top of that, there is this now unfortunate sort of attempt by the usual suspects to politicize for their own ends, for their own agendas, um, w- what is happening. And and they're so obvious, I'm talking about Republicans. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm not even going to differentiate them into MAGA Republicans at this point, because the silence is, is deafening coming from the reasonable Republicans that remain in the party, right? Um, they're, first, first, they almost instantly came out in this very coordinated uh agenda again coordinated attack or disinformation campaign about what i call the six billion dollar lie right so that was almost instantaneous it was oddly coordinated and oddly instantaneous and all of us are shocked shocked that that somehow they all just said the same thing at the same time i'm sure it's it's totally random and coincidental it's not at all coordinated from up on high at all but yeah so yeah it was shocking how (laughs) coordinated it was for a group that's always parroting in propaganda from others. Yeah. But so there's the $6 billion lie that again, speaking from my own truth as a a woman who lives in the suburbs where moms at the grocery store and baseball games are like, Hey, did you hear about this $6 billion that the Biden administration gave to Iran? And they're like, I don't even know how Iran is connected to this, but I've been told, you know, via whatever news sites I'm watching or whatever, that that money was what funded this attack. So the Biden administration gave the money to Hamas to commit this, uh, these atrocities. So let's just start there. Let's unpack the anatomy of a smear. Right? Yeah. Yes. Um, so this is the, essentially I would describe this as an attempt uh, to portray Joe Biden and Democrats as those who stabbed in the back, stabbed in the back, the Jews. Right. That's what the attempt was for political opportunistic purposes. Right out of the gate, Ronna McDaniel, the um, she should be fired for this. Um, unconscionable that the blood was not even dry it had not yet been it it stopped running and she was on tv saying this is a political opportunity for republicans to portray joe biden as weak and a supporter essentially uh ergo a supporter of hamas and the terrorism that murdered these israelis Mm -hmm. so um others followed suit and um I did an MSNBC hit on this and I asked the question, why do Republicans hate Joe Biden more than they love Israel? Excellent question. Still haven't gotten an answer yet from Mm -hmm. McDaniel. Um, You know, I think the, the idea that they're trying to argue there is that uh, anything bad in the world is Joe Biden's fault. And by doing that, they expose their inhumanity to the situation we have a long history in this country of coming together in crises on a bipartisan basis. I was serving in a federal government position at the time here in Washington at the time of 911. I was actually giving a speech outside the Pentagon. I was running a program for the energy department at the time on solar energy. And I was in this uh, hotel near the Pentagon in the top floor and heard the plane fly over our head and crash into the Pentagon. We saw the smoke coming out. We ran to the basement, the floor, and we were in military lockdown. 
we then saw what our leaders did. And what our leaders did was unify to bring us together as a country. In Israel right now, they have a unity government. If you've been watching Israeli politics, it's more vicious in our politics. <laughs> there have been people protesting in the street for nine months saying, get rid of Netanyahu. Judicial reform that he's promoting is a coup against democracy. Positions that I tend to agree with, but very aggressively against Netanyahu. Um, you know what the opposition did after this attack? They called for a unity government. And yesterday, last night, they got one. And so right now, the war-making powers are being shared by Netanyahu and his chief political rival. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's how you do it when you actually care about your country. You could do the opposite and attack your commander-in-chief, who is the single most important person on the planet to defending Israel right now. Make no mistake, when Joe Biden made his speech the other day, it was received in Israel with tears of joy that the United States was there to support them in their moment of need. But the Republicans wanted to undercut Joe Biden, which would do what? Nothing but harm Israel. I heard from my cousins in Israel. They all were grateful. People across the spectrum in the Jewish world, grateful. Like, so, so this politicization kind of, kind of, um, poisons the well a little bit. So we have to look past it because we're better than that. But it really shows the depths and there is no low enough for these people when it comes to trying to get power politically. They're willing to smear the person who can save Jewish lives in Israel in order to win elections. And I just find that horrifying. And to your point, you know, at 9-11, I remember I me mean, just this sort of moment like with George Bush throwing a baseball, you know, at Yankee Stadium. And there you go. Right. So and it didn't people we, cheered him in New York. Yeah. We were and we were all for a moment, for a moment, able to put, you know, politics aside and, and unite. And our government was the lead on that. Um, and that is well, not well, yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead, can, go I, ahead. Can, I, can I say, you know, yeah. when it turned, of course, is when they politicized it. This is not like new for the Republicans. Yeah, right. It's when they politicized and they wanted to push people to support the war in Iraq and yeah. said, if you don't support the war in Iraq, you're with the terrorists. Right. Call the Rove tactic in the 2002 midterms. Uh, and, and that smear job is just the, in the DNA of the Republicans on national security. And it's how it's gotten to this point now. I mean, it really just kind of festered and it's now we're at the point where we're looking at them using the smear again to, to damage our president, who is when they're tweeting, I stand with Israel or Xing or whatever it's called. And then they're undermining the person who can facilitate helping Israel. Not only that, it's not only just their posturing. They're doing there's so many layers because there's this new like xenophobia that are pushing um, where they're trying to fear monger about how Hamas is now coming here. And they're layering that with this is a call for arms. Go get your AR-15s now. So there's all of that, too. Right. So it's all again. sort of. I always think of them. As and, and then we could add another layer. It's not like this is a political party that is exactly friendly to American Jews. <laughs> Right. And it's it's certainly not a political party that's unfamiliar with te terrorism because they themselves, uh, you know, I was talking to um, Peter Strzok, who was like describing this as sort of the same kind of radicalization that's happening in MAGA that, you know, he and, and the CIA studied, you know, with other terrorist organizations. It's not like they're that far apart. And there's so many layers there, too. But the thing at the end of the day, it's, it's that their messaging is so toxic and terrible and awful and undermining and intentional to be destroyed destructive and, and all of dismantling and all of those things that they're their usual calling cards. But it's the fact that all of this with the chaos that is ensuing in the House of Representatives is literally hurting Israel because they don't have, thanks to Matt Gates, the wonder kid and his five head. And I'm sorry, I shouldn't have gone that way because that was mean, <laughs> girl, but it's still it is what it is. But the chaos that's ensuing in the House of Representatives, they don't have a speaker. They have a speaker pro tem who we don't even know what kind of powers he actually has. He doesn't really have the powers. He doesn't have any foreign policy experience. He's just a little guy from North Carolina who has to stand on a crate with pressers. Right. I mean, Gavelgate on the crate is the pro tem. He, he, we don't know what his powers are. So this chaos is not helping Israel. What I want to talk about that real quick. Like, I know there's not a real quick, but what how is what's going on there? No speaker. How is that impacting how we're able to help Israel? 
So when I was in the Obama administration, I was the senior liaison for the State Department to the House of Representatives. I was our, uh, our, our senior person basically dealing with the leadership of the House. And so what that meant is that every day I interacted with the John Boehner led House Republicans. So I know a little bit about what it means to engage and fight on foreign policy with these guys. But you know what you need in a moment of crisis from Congress and, and in this case from the House? A leader. <laughs> if you don't have a leader, you have chaos. You have total breakdown of decision making and nothing gets done. And, and, and the Speaker of the House has a, a direct role uh, in intelligence. It's one of the one of the the core eight uh, uh, recipients of intelligence briefings across the the complex Senate and House. Uh, it's this not is called the gang of like gang maybe. Of <laughs> this is th these are like I mean it's a gang right? But Nancy, yeah. Pelosi, Nancy Pelosi, to our benefit, took the job seriously. Yeah. So you know we have that. Uh, when it comes to the Republicans, this guy who's acting has literally no national security background. So that's a mess. Now, what about decisions? What about priorities? Uh, what about uh, approvals of uh, requests by the executive branch, the Biden administration for certain weapon systems? Who makes decisions? How do they structure it? There are a lot of committees, a lot of cooks in the kitchen. Ultimately, the speaker makes the call and is the boss. So we have no boss right now over there. Uh, and so Republicans, not only are they messaging in a dark, dirty, smear way, but literally, if anyone will be responsible for no new money going to Israel to support it in its time of need, it's going to be the House Republicans for failing to have a leadership. And, and so, again, back to just real quick, again, real quick, but the, the, this, this lack of leadership that they're attributing this money going from Biden to Hamas through Iran. So they're actually, and we can get into the $6 billion lie because they're, that money is not it's not from the taxpayers it's via Biden, via Iran, via it's not. So the, so they're they're They keep pointing the finger at Biden not helping Israel when at the end of the day, not only are they hurting Israel with the chaos in the house, but but the six billion dollar lie is based on mistruths and misinformation, to say the very least. I mean, they're, they're gaslighting from the house because they're the ones not providing the support to Israel. And then a right. six billion dollar thing. Um, let's just uh, explain that real, real briefly. Bottom line is. The United States, uh, Joe Biden was able to get five Americans out of Iran about a month ago who were essentially hostages there in prison. And part of the deal was that we would allow South Korean banks that had been holding six billion dollars of Iranian funds that they had earned through oil revenues, allowed those to be transferred to our ally, Qatar. <laughs> and Qatar would then disperse those funds to humanitarian organizations that operate inside of Iran, period. Yeah. That's it. So the first reality is that no money's going to Iran, never has, never will. Second is the money hasn't even gone to Qatar yet <laughs> for use. <laughs> and, and then the third is that you didn't need, and let's just be blunt, Hamas doesn't need an excuse or extra money to attack Israelis. They've been doing this for decades. Right. So the whole thing is garbage. The whole thing is just an attempt to politically smear Joe Biden for doing something that actually freed Americans out of Iran. Yeah. I mean, it's it's so anti-American. It's so hostile to the principles of the United States that we take every effort possible to get our people home from harm's way. It's so anti-Israel. Mm -hmm. It's so harmful to the confidence of the American Jewish community in the political process here working on behalf of our uh, ally Israel. And all it is is for cheap political points in a very near term way. Uh, it's it's grotesque. That's the their whole kind of MO is this very near term way. It's, it's just like, let's let's burn this thing down that's in front of me right now. I don't care what other things are built on top of it or rely upon it or come down the road. I want to burn this thing down right now because I need that to happen. And the, all of their posturing on being pro-Israel while they're doing things that are harming Israel and could harm Israel in a, and not just Israel, Jewish people all over the world in a very real and sustained way. Um, it is it's grotesque, and that's sort of like that's their one of their few party platforms is just being monstrous and grotesque. The, <laughs> uh, on that, on that, I, I just want to finally kind of wrap up a little bit. Um, I was going to ask what, what can be done in the region. Um, oh, yeah. 
it's a big question. And so I, I'll ask that sort of coupled with what can like a regular American citizen, someone like me or my friends at the grocery store, or the baseball games that we're having these conversations, like what can we actually do here? Um, so that's a sort of a two part, very, very broad question. But um, that, well, let's go with that anyway. Well, the first thing is, is um, I take my cues from the Israelis on this kind of a, a question about what can be done in this immediate conflict zone. And uh, my Israeli cousins who I've been in touch with, there are two themes that I hear consistently. The first is that we will overcome. We will, we will make this. Uh, there's a real can-do spirit. And I, I want to make sure that people know, first and foremost, we will be able to come through this together. Uh, we will um, we will overcome this period, but we will only overcome it by sticking together. But that's part A. I don't want to be the guy who says we will win. That's not that's not how I, I frame things. But we will overcome this and we will get through this. The second is a, a line of hope. Like, I hope that there will be a better day is what I'm hearing. I hope that after this, things will get better. So we have to have hope. And, and, and hope means investing in humanity. Hope means supporting the people in their time of need, uh, building bridges, reaching out. So in the near term, what can be done is sending... Uh, first of all, support to your Jewish friends and, and people here in the area, people who I, I can't tell you how many conversations I've had with people who are like, am I alone? Are all these people I've been working with for years in social justice turning their back on me right now? Don't be afraid. Don't be shy. Call them, text them. That is crucial. Uh, the second thing is, is that you, you can... Uh, support organizations. There's a, a, the, uh, uh, there are ways to support Israeli um, uh, uh, enterprises and humanitarian enterprises, as well as for the Palestinians who are going to suffer. And I want to say that clearly. One thing that's very important, we didn't touch on it a lot, but uh, it, it, it is incredibly important, is that Hamas's victims also are Palestinians. The Palestinian people in Gaza are suffering under this kind of could you imagine people like that what they did to the israelis running i mean imagine if like we had you know maga people no, I take yeah. that back. Ima yeah. imagine they're so horrible so mm -hmm. so that kind of humanitarian support what can be done in the big picture though is making sure that and it sounds political but i'll say it, making sure that joe biden remains president in a year mm -hmm. um what he's doing right now is showing american leadership in the region by sending out an aircraft carrier, uh, telling Hezbollah and others, don't get involved, don't do more, do not create a regional war. And he's also sending his diplomats, Secretary Blinken and others who I've worked with for many years in the in, when I was a Senate staffer and then in the Obama administration. These are good people, heartfelt people, they care. They're going around the Middle East, talking to our allies diplomatically and, and essentially saying, how do we get, let's get the hostages out, Let's keep the thing calm. Let's, you know, engage. Um, that's the way to do it. You know, if we had had Donald Trump in the White House right now, well, first of all, he's trashing Israel for, for this, which is bizarre world, but that's only for politics, clearly. It makes, you know, Donald Trump really does not like the Jewish people at all. Mm -mm. So this is, maybe this is who is, he, you got to believe this is who he is. But if he were in the White House, there are people out there right now the people who created this ridiculous meme uh, about the six billion who uh, also worked for Trump. And they're essentially saying, bomb Iran, right? Let's start a new war. Right. <laughs> First of all, insane. You laugh because it's it's like so ridiculous. Yeah. Well, I was here when we went after Iraq and that was ridiculous. And I was yeah. laughing, like, what? Yeah. Uh, and, and what that would do is that would undermine Israel's ability to actually confront Hamas. So we need sane leaders in power who are measured and do the right thing in a patient way. But this is not going to be easy. So us as Americans, I, I just think, you know, reach out to your friends, reach out to people who are suffering, think about humanitarian support, have hope, elect a person who's smart and knows how to run things and keep on following it. Paying attention to it really matters. It really makes a difference. But at the end of the day, Joe, I mean, this is, ultimately going to be the Israelis and their public and the Palestinians and their public dealing with this and the fallout of this. And um, we have to, we have to make sure 
that they understand that we have their back and that the Israelis also understand that there is a day after this fight that they have to plan for as well. Um, it's going to be hard. It's very hard. And this is the kind of hell that Hamas unleashed on all of us. That is um, an excellent way to answer that question. It's obviously clearly complex, but there is this sense, again, that because we have competent, reasonable, reasonable, sane people in, in place at the top, not everywhere, but at the top, that that region doesn't feel it doesn't feel like anyone's trying to take advantage of a weakness in the, you know, in, in American government. Nailed it. Yeah, you know it. I mean, look, I mean, I, it, it, I, I'm sorry to just belabor it, but I, I'll just say um, in international affairs and national security policy, there are, there's hard power and soft power. And so we we basically had the same hard power under Trump that we have under Biden. You know, the defense budget is pretty much static or similar. The investments in the long run. I mean, you know this personally, you know how this works. There's like, you know, infrastructure in place, right? Okay. The soft power is what's different. And that's where the leader comes in. And the soft power is the voice and the word and the strategy. If you look at Ukraine and what President Biden is doing, he isn't just providing military hardware to Ukraine. He's mobilizing the world and building confidence amongst the Ukrainians and our allies that they'll be okay. And that's the exact same thing he's doing right now. And that keeps things in a position of, of, of manageable, mm -hmm. right? The alternative, walking away like what some folks want to do in Ukraine or walking away on Israel because it's not our problem and we don't need to think about it and, you know, blinders on, is inviting more chaos. And so this is the way to do it. And this is why I feel like how, no matter how painful this is, the captain of the ship is steering strong and we have to follow that, emulate that and stay strong and understand it will be hard, but not lose our mind, not lose our cool and not walk away. Yeah. And on that note, um, I don't want to just touch on also, I believe that hope is a daily practice that we can all employ on, on many different levels and, and here as well. But on this note that, that you just beautifully articulated, I was, you know, looking at your campaign video on uh, Twitter or X or whatever you call it, still call it Twitter. So you yeah. said that the reason you got in public service was because of the Jewish value. And help me here. Uh, loom, takun, how do you say? Yes. Sorry. To heal the world. And that inspired you to ask what you could do for your country. And that's why you've spent your entire career dedicated to public service and to leaving the world a better place than you found it. And everything we've talked about, honestly, has just sort of borne that out to be so true. And you truly are endeavoring to make this a, a better world than you found it. And, and I thank you so much for that. But it's not just for, you know, and you're, you're running for Congress and then hopefully you, you, you'll be able to change this system from the inside out. Um, but I talking to you has just been so inspiring in this way. You can you can feel that not for, for so many different reasons, but that this truly is what what inspires you. You're a father of three, but, you know, you want we believe you can heal the world and um, you know, you're, you're, you're going through a lot. The Israeli people are going through a lot. The Palestinians are going through a lot. There's a lot of pain and we need more voices out there who are seeking to heal the world. So I thank you so much for yours. Thank you. Thank you for everything. Thank you for, for providing the opportunity for me to, to speak about this with you and your audience. Yeah, I, I, I just, I cannot think of anything at the moment that was more important for me because so much this, this is, it's it's on my mind and I'm not impacted by it directly, but, and I'm going to cry because I'm a dork, but like, it's so important to have these conversations. Obviously I'm crying and I have an ugly cry. So we, nobody needs to see that. Um, But yeah, thank you. And, and everybody should follow you and watch, um, you know, you on TV and wherever you appear, because um, what is your Twitter X handle or whatever, and what, what other socials can they find you on? Because your message is so clear, so concise and so um, impassioned. Uh, so where can they find you so that they can get all of more information from you? Yeah, no, look, I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, uh, on X, yeah. I'm at Joel, I know it's so weird. <laughs> Joel Martin Rubin and Joel Martin Rubin, because uh, that's what they gave me. 
And uh, I'm on Instagram at Joel M. Ruben and on Facebook. Uh, my website is Ruben for Congress. I can't remember all the other socials. <laughs> I think I'm on Spoutable now. Oh right. And There's I'm on LinkedIn. Reds and posts. <laughs> so many. Um, but, you know, Ruben for Ruben for Maryland dot com and Joel Martin Rubin uh for my Twitter and then you'll you'll see the other stuff there and I pop up every now and again on 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 TV and 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 all and sign up for the emails you'll never be lonely I think <laughs> ever again um, <laughs> but um you know I I think I think um in this moment where we share so much on social and we communicate so much to have a deep conversation like this is incredibly um cathartic for me and uh hopefully helpful for the audience as they think through this and, and again what we spoke about at the beginning i encourage people to remember this is an ongoing learning um window and uh there's so much to learn about this it goes very deep it's multi-dimensional so um hopefully this is a helpful appetizer for some of the folks as well who are tuning in uh, on on this issue for the you know the their the early stages the first time or yeah. you know part of their learning of it but yeah. um thank you Joe thank you so much um again these conversations are so important so I am so grateful to you for having this one with me. And uh, with that, thank you so much again for joining me. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your day, the rest of your week. And everybody who, you know, watch this or listen to it, thank you so much. And we will see you next Saturday. Thanks, Joel. Look, I think we can all agree, if we can't agree on much else, that these are pretty crazy times. And navigating all of that every day can be pretty stressful. In my case, add two middle schoolers and there are just some days where I'm dragging myself across the finish line. And then there are the nights when a glass of wine or two fits the de-stress bill. But let's be honest, I'm a busy mom. I can't be waking up feeling like crap, whether that's that second glass of wine I had or eating my daughter's leftover chicken fingers because I didn't want them to go to waste. Either way, Enter Z-Biotics. Here's how you use it. Step one, have a Z-Biotics. For best results, make Z-Biotics your first drink of the night. Step two, drink responsibly. Pace yourself, hydrate, and get a good night's sleep. Step three, enjoy tomorrow. Wake up feeling refreshed and ready to take on the day. Z-Biotics Pre-Alcohol Probiotic. Your first drink of the night for a better tomorrow. Engineered by a team of PhD microbiologists, Zbiotics is a probiotic drink that breaks down the byproduct of alcohol, which is what's responsible for those rough mornings after drinking. So go to zbiotics.com slash political voices or scan the QR code on the screen right now to get 15% off your first order when you use political voices at checkout. Again, Go to zbiotics.com slash political voices or scan the QR code on the screen right now.